This episode of the Cult Popshire podcast was brought to you by our Patreon. If you want to tell us which films we should watch or get two extra exclusive podcasts a month, then please consider joining the cult and donating at www.patreon.com slash cultpopshire. Richard, hey man, guess what? Uh, we've got a live show. We've got a live show coming up. That's right. Let's Shame get this up it. top out of the way first. Um, we are doing a live episode of Film Franchise Fortnights, Richard, on December 16th at 7.30 in Christchurch, New Zealand at Little Andromeda. Are you excited? Uh, No. Well, that bodes well for all the people thinking of coming then. I was going to be like, I'm feeling this emotion, but I just couldn't think of another word. <laughs> so I, I only like, know. Yeah, I guess I I'm just not excited. <laughs> the only emotion I know is not excited. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, we're going to be talking about the Santa Claus trilogy um, live at Little Andromeda in Christchurch. So there'll be a link to the event in the description. Tickets are $5. You can buy them at the door or online. Uh, you could probably just buy them at the door. I think only like five have sold online, so we should be all good. Um, we've got a special guest, Brendan Bennett from Scared Scriptless and The Nerd Degree joining us. It's going to be a good time, Richard, and if no one shows up, it will be very embarrassing. <laughs> and we will feel very sad. That's true, <laughs> but sad. there's no there's no reason to feel sad right at the moment, my friend, because... Uh, this is an episode, of course, of Film Franchise Fortnite's Not Live. It's live for us, though. It's live right now for yeah, you I'm and me. Yeah, I'm alive. Oh, that's good. I want to uh, just address the elephant in the room right away. Mm. Um, I'm not sick. Okay. I, I have a funny sounding voice at the moment because it was my office Christmas party last night and there was a talent competition and I got real yelly. <laughs> <laughs> there was like because that's your talent yelling yeah no but um <laughs> yeah so there's just people these random people from the building that i've never seen before and one of them was this guy colin whose talent he had these like poles and he we would fuck like colin dude and he would like um you know he, he would could do like handstands <laughs> with like holding these poles on the ground i don't know i'm describing it real bad but it was like acrobatic kind of stuff it was quite impressive but then when they're like, give it up for Colin, I was like, I screamed like, yes, Colin, you fucking <laughs> unit. And then the CEO of TVNZ was standing next to me and he like pissed himself laughing. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. It was so funny. Um, and I was like, you, you earn way too much money. You, you, um... <laughs> Um, that I'm glad you found my joke funny, but I am planning on eating you. Um, <laughs> the, the, you dressed up as as in game Thor. Yeah, for, I did for your party, and everyone was like, "Oh my god, you're fat Thor!" And I'm like, "I'm actually just Thor." Yeah, I was gonna say, I I I think that that we should just be calling him Thor. No one calls me Fat AJ because they knew me ten years ago. Yeah, um, <laughs> he's actually uh, officially by Marvel. He's referred to as Bro Thor. Ah, that's good. That's a good, good way to do it. Well, I, or like, or Dude Thor, I thought would be like a good because he's essentially dressed as the dude from the Big Lebowski. Mm. Do you have are there photos? Maybe we should put some on the on the Insta. That could um, be fun for people. There's photos somewhere. I think. Sweet. Maybe we'll put them up if you find them, or if you don't want to, that's also cool. <laughs> so yes, this is Film Franchise Four Nights on the Cole Popture Podcast. This episode, uh, we're covering a franchise, a film franchise that was suggested by patron our patrons over at patreon.com slash Uh And we were like, it's Christmas, so uh, there's not a lot of Christmas like solely Christmas franchises left, so give us one that at least has one film fr film that's uh, that's a Christmas themed film. And the winner was the Harold and Kumar trilogy, of which the final film in the trilogy is a Christmas film. Oh, the final so film now. <laughs> yes, I say so, that like I'm um, going to make the next one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so my name is AJ, and this is Richard. And join us for a splendiferous, festivus, uh, very fun, very exciting adventure as we explore the Harold and Kumar trilogy in this Christmassy episode. Yeah, I, this to, is I feel a, like uh, I have to say it's Christmassy because <laughs> two thirds of it aren't Christmassy. I think there's Christmassy elements in them. 
Okay. And maybe we'll That's find good. them on this podcast. The Yuletide's pretty gay. The Yuletide's pretty gay. Come on. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Yep. Sweet. So, <laughs> the <laughs> the Harold and Kumar trilogy is a stoner comedy franchise which focuses on the marijuana-infused antics slash hijinks of Harold Lee and Kumar Patel, portrayed by John Cho and Cal Penn, respectively. Uh, while the series is now our latest addition to the hall of troubling, problematic, dated comedy franchises like, what, The Hangover? What are the other ones? American Pie? Revenge of um, the Nerds. Revenge of the Nerds. There's a few more than that. Um, it should probably be pointed out that the Harold and Kumar trilogy has the distinction of making some pretty socially relevant commentaries on racism. Um, the Korean, American, and Indian American leads often encounter racially charged obstacles from ignorant white people profiling them as terrorists and criminals. It's a huge theme across across all three films. Um, so I guess it gets woke points in that department. Uh, but that being said, it's sexism toll might be one of the highest I think we've ever covered in a lot of mm-hmm. ways. Uh, so get ready for us to sigh and defeatedly proclaim it was a different time. Several instances in this episode, not as an excuse, but as an explanation. I'm not, I'm not excusing it. I'm saying this is why it's like this. Yeah. This is why I'm hot. This is why I'm hot. I'm hot. Cause I'm fly. You ain't cause you're not. What is that a Harold and Kumar reference? No, no, I just came up with it. Nice. Do you like the My Dick song in Harold and Kumar Escape from Guantanamo Bay? Uh, yeah, you know Aquafina? You know like the actress yeah. Aquafina? Do you know that she got big by doing a parody of that song called My Vag? Oh, interesting. And that, that I didn't was like, realize it was a big enough song to do a parody of. Yeah, and then so it was like... Um, yeah, and then it was like, hey, remember that girl that sings the My Vag song? She's going to be in Ocean's 8. <laughs> well, we're not talking about... And now she's like about... potentially going to be nominated for an Oscar, apparently. For what? The Farewell. Yeah. Apparently it's a very good performance. All right. Well, we're getting ahead of ourselves, Richard, because the the first film that we watched this fortnight was Harold and Kumar Go to White Castle. That came out in 2004 and was directed by Danny Lena, who also directed Dude, Where's My Car?, which is referenced in Harold and Kumar Go to White Castle. <laughs> what do you think this has on Rotten Tomatoes? Um, yeah, so, uh, funnily enough, I actually have no idea. I, the, the, <laughs> this is a film franchise that I like. Um, I know quite well, and I, I, I mm. probably know uh, at least until you did the research for this episode. I, I knew better than you, kind of thing. Um, yeah. But and I, now I I've painstakingly researched three to four wikipedia pages and an imdb trivia board and now i know more (laughs) (laughs) um so i i'm guessing none of them are fresh uh two of them are fresh really okay Mm -hmm. uh well in that case i'm gonna go 72 70 foul so pretty close yeah and just uh we we say this every maybe 10 episodes of film franchise four nights just a reminder that uh rotten tomatoes is not a ranking of every film in existence on a percentage <laughs> scale it's more like a how, how likely, likely you are, are to enjoy it yeah. so you are 74 percent likely to enjoy harold and kumar well yeah to, to give it above a you know five out of ten a five yeah. or a ten or higher essentially yeah so what is Harold and Kumar Go to White Castle about? Uh, so Harold and Kumar are uh, uh, a couple of lovable stoners who uh, get high on some uh, marijuanas. And, I've um, never heard of that. What's that? <laughs> um, I don't have time to explain that to you. Um, but essentially we, we, they- We did briefly play with the idea of us getting stoned and recording this episode. I've yeah. never been stoned before, so that would have been yeah, a Yeah, neither of us but... like smoke weed. Yeah, sorry. Sorry for all the stoners listening. Yeah, yeah, who are like, oh yeah, fuck yeah. Um, it's not happening. Maybe when we do Cheech and Chong, and um, if, when uh, weed will be legalised by then. I'll do weed if it's legal. That's probably been the main reason I've... I, I can't be bothered going through, like, a back alley drug drug dealer yeah, yeah. and shit. Anyway. So anyway, yeah, they, um, they decide they need to go to... Uh, White Castle because it's the only thing that'll satisfy their munchies because they uh, they do quite simple sliders so like quite small burgers mm. and um, yeah they have a, it's 
it's essentially a road movie, I guess, but um, the you know it's it's a quest to go and find this mythical white castle. Um, well, it's not mythical; it's a real place. <laughs> <laughs> it's a twenty four hour white castle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. And uh, so yeah, uh, Kumar is supposed to have this interview for med school the next day, and Harold's like stuck in a dead end job. And so it's kind of, you know, this big liberating experience for both of them. Uh, and what are some of the things that they encounter on the way? They go to a university um, mm-hmm. and, like, run into Wacky. some people there. <laughs> um, uh, Neil Patrick Harris shows up, which is kind of what... Oh, I, I, one of the things that this, um, this franchise is known for is the Neil Patrick Harris cameos in all three movies. Mm-hmm. And so he plays, like... Uh, well, because because obviously Neil Patrick Harris is gay in real life, and then his one of his most famous roles is Barney Stinson, where he plays like a womanizer and mm-hmm. and stuff like that. But then in um in Harold and Kumar, it's like that turned up to eleven, where he's like, you know, drug addicted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and yeah, and they they like there's a a cheetah escapes from the zoo, and they have to ride it for a bit. And there's hillbillies after them, and there's racists after them. It's just it's a bunch of interchangeable antics uh, between them going to get White Castle and getting White Castle, which they successfully do get in the end. Mm. And um, and a very uh, what what binging with Babish referred to as a culinary cathartic scene where they, it just shows them mm. eating the food they've been trying to get all night. So that was followed four years later in 2008 by Harold and Kumar Escape from Guantanamo Bay. This was directed by John Hurwitz and Hayden Schlossberg, um, who are actually the writers and kind of the the m- minds behind the entire trilogy. Mm. Uh, and they also directed American Reunion, which we've mm. discussed on the show before. What do you think Harold and Kumar Escape from Guantanamo Bay has on Rotten Tomatoes? Uh, 60... Three. 52 mm. so this is, isn't isn't one of the fresh ones and no. what is this film about <laughs> tell me about their adventures how they escape from guantanamo Bay. okay so um at the end of the first film um harold uh finally like gets the girl but she's just on her way to amsterdam so they're like fuck it let's go to amsterdam because weed's legal there so the film starts right where the last one left off and um you have that they're getting in a plane, and but Kumar has this idea to have a smoke-free bong essentially, so that he can smoke weed on the plane. And there's this racist old woman uh, who believes that he's some kind of terrorist, and um, that the device is a bomb, and gets them thrown off the plane and into Guantanamo Bay. Uh, now they manage to escape. And then they journey back to mainland USA, where they then have a bunch of wacky adventures to try and clear their name. They, um, uh, yeah, they 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 go to a bottomless party that their friend is throwing, which is just a bunch of women with no pants on, um, mm. and, and men. But there's only one other yeah. man at the party. Um, <laughs> and uh what else they, they encounter more hillbillies they encounter, the encounter KKK. Yeah, more hillbillies more um neil patrick harris they go to yeah. a brothel with him <clears throat> mm-hmm. um but yeah eventually um they <laughs> they crash land they they because they get caught again and are being taken back to guantanamo bay but they jump out of the plane and crash land on george w bush's ranch and so this was this um came out when he was still in office as well yeah. um and he was like fuck it let's get high he's like no nah, fuck it i'll pardon you guys it's all good <laughs> and then um they go off on the amsterdam adventure together yeah because um this is kind of like kumar's romantic quest as well because there's a, mm. an ex-girlfriend he's trying to get with the whole time yeah it's it's a bigger and not necessarily better sequel a lot bigger like mm. it takes the kind of the point of the first one which was that it's very low stakes and has them meet the president so um a lot of sequels <laughs> do this and uh, a lot of them are almost never regarded as better for doing it <laughs> anyway um so three years later where we got a very harold and kumar 3d christmas uh, this was directed by Todd Stross Schulson, who also directed Isn't It Romantic, your favourite Netflix <laughs> Rebel Wilson comedy. 
Oh, boy, have I not thought about that since I watched it. <laughs> and what do you think a very, very Harold and Kumar 3D Christmas has on Rotten Tomatoes? Uh, well, so this has got to be like low 60s, 66. It's actually 68. Oh. It's quite high 60s, some yeah. would say. All would say if they're being technically correct. Why well, I said low 60s, but then I went for 66 um mm, that's true what's it about well so this one uh it takes us back to the kind of lower stakes of the um of the first film it's uh been years since harold and kumar have seen each other they had some kind of falling out harold's now you know living a button down kind of uh lifestyle he's now uh with the lives with the woman that he was trying to get with at the end of the first film um and you know the whole second film was about uh well kumar has broken up uh, him and his him and his girlfriend have broken up when maria that's her name uh harold's partner's parent uh you know family comes to visit played by danny trejo um uh, as her dad <laughs> the whole family the whole family the whole family's played trejo. by Dar- danny um, trejo and masks yeah and so wins. um he's he's big into christmas and um, the whole idea of it is essentially that Harold has this like white Christmas tree and Danny Trejo comes in and is like, nah, you need a real one. So he brings in his one he's been growing for eight years. Then Kumar shows up, accidentally burns it down. And the whole adventure is them trying to find um, another like 12 foot tree. Uh, like real Christmas tree on Christmas Eve. And again, they have a bunch of adventures. Um, they go to a party, which is like thrown by the kids of this mob boss. Um, mm-hmm. And then they run into Neil Patrick Harris again, except the thing is that in the three years between Guantanamo Bay and ha- Christmas, ha- uh, you know, Neil Patrick Harris was in Happy Mother and became one of the biggest stars in the world. And so, mm. um, yeah, it's quite different because he is playing himself in these movies. Or a fictionalized version of himself, and it also became, I think, more public knowledge that he's gay in between that time. Yeah, and so this movie plays with that idea a lot, where you find out he's actually faking being gay to uh, seduce more women, essentially. Yeah, um, yeah. They they accidentally shoot down Santa Claus. Yeah, um, it's not a Santatheist movie. It's not a Santatheist movie. Uh, so yeah, full of Christmas adventures and antics, um, and then. At the end, they reconnect their friends again, and they get a tree. No, they don't get a tree, but Harold stands up to his, to Danny Trejo, and Danny Trejo's like, I like you, kid. You got balls. But he doesn't say cojones. those words exactly. But it's that. It's that. Cajones. He says cojones. I wasn't even doing an accent, though. Let's do I was doing like a New York mob boss accent. Yeah. How'd you like to come work for me? Um, <laughs> yeah, so which film is your favourite, Richard? What is your Harold and Kumar ranking? And what is your relationship to the series? You said you knew a lot about it. Yeah, So okay. maybe we can delve into that a bit. So, more. I yeah, I've got a real interesting relationship with this series, kind of. I, um, I've seen all three movies a few times. I think I've seen um, Guantanamo Bay like quite a lot. Um, because I, I watched it at like a sleepover. We just like randomly picked a movie. I don't think I even knew it was a sequel. Um, and yeah, we just watched this movie cause you know, it was, it had boobs and weed and stuff like that. And, uh, and you know, mm. and we were all and, like, as a bunch of teenagers, oh my God, this is gonna be the coolest movie ever. I love boobs and weed. <laughs> And so, uh, you yeah, watched that, and then I, I'm pretty sure I got it like on my old iPod Classic, and because I just had a bunch of like movies on that, so it was one that I watched quite a bit, just like in bed before I go to bed. I'd watch like, it's it, it, it's an iPod Classic movie. Yeah, <laughs> and <is>. um, <laughs> then I watched the fir- when I watched the first one, and I've, I've you know I've seen that probably like half a dozen times, and then I um. Yeah, I remember waiting for the, like, I remember it feeling like it was ages waiting for the um, third one to come out. So maybe I watched Guantanamo Bay, like, pretty soon after it came out mm. because it felt like, oh, because there was actually drama about whether or not the third one would even happen because Cal Penn mm, yeah. quit acting yeah, um, to go work at the White House. Yeah. Which I'm sure you'll we will. bring up later on. That that That's a whole thing. Don't you worry about <laughs> it. Um, 
And then, yeah, finally the third one came out. It wasn't released theatrically or anything here. And I remember one school holidays, I set a goal to watch a film every day. And it was like 11 p.m. I was on my laptop and I was like, oh, fuck yeah, that Harold and Kumar movie came out. So I was like, yeah, I'll watch this. And then I also, um, like a last Christmas or the one before, me, uh, me and fan of the podcast, Tyler, um, a friend of mine, uh we watch like shitty christmas movies every year and so last year or the year before we watched harold and kuma christmas uh nice. but as for my ranking mm. uh this is a real interesting one because i growing up i always loved the the second one the most and then that was the one that watching now i was most like fuck this has not aged well this is just sh- <laughs> this is yeah this it is was shit. a different time <laughs> yeah well but like even just like not not even from like an offensive or like a cultural point of view, it's just like these just jokes aren't funny or whatever. Um, yeah. But that that is the one that has the most kind of like racist and sexist stuff. But it is you're laughing at a lot of the character, like because there is one racist character who is the um, the sort of FBI agent going after them, and you know you're supposed to laugh at how idiotic he is. I think it's 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 hearts in the right place. Re the the conversations about racism. Yeah, I don't know about sexism. <laughs> I don't think it realizes how sexist right, right. it is. Uh, and then the third one is like, because in some ways it's like clearly not as good as the first two. But then it's like, what kind of a bar is that? Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, the third one probably has like elements of it are some of my favorite stuff in the series like the mph scene in that movie is mm-hmm. so funny i I'd like that like the idea of him still having that same persona because when we when we meet neil patrick harris in the third movie he's like oh you know it's going to be difficult to um to do that between having your mother and all my charity work and all this mm-hmm. stuff and then as soon as he gets to the room alone he's like you know the classic carol and kuma mph but then watching the first movie which i was always uh not as attached to i think it's like that kind of still holds up as this genre of film um like it it is still uh yeah in in a lot of ways like you could get i'm presuming you could get high and put this movie on and still have a great time you know someone said that to me they're like are you getting high while watching them because that's the only way to enjoy them and i was like that's interesting i never thought like to me i probably quite naively assume that the best stuff to watch while high would be like real trippy stuff like i don't know well, like, I guess, well it's either there or stuff that is only funny if you're high right okay um okay well very interesting i also saw the first two films as a teenager um i think i saw them in order and i think i saw white castle in 2008 so i didn't have to wait very long at all before um mm-hmm. discovering guantanamo bay i'd never seen the third one until the other day watching it for the podcast um and i'd say i'm pretty lukewarm on all three films but mm. i do feel that they're all operating at about the same level of quality which is rare for this kind of franchise yeah it, like, it's surprisingly consistent yeah i think guantanamo bay is the weakest um and i'm probably about equal on white castle and 3d christmas though you describing 3d christmas before i was like yeah white castle is better but 3d christmas i still probably enjoyed more than i was expecting to which is fun that's a cool thing yeah (laughs) Um, uh but despite my lukewarmness i do recognize that like as sort of what you said the dna of harold and kumar go to white castle is so ingrained in the teen sex comedy genre and it's like you know, it's cousins, the stoner comedy. Genre yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's, like it's, it's a modern comedy. Cheech and Chong. Yeah, um, and yeah, it's everything from like the comedy of errors to the even like the the like cheeky DVD poster. How it's like them in a white background with like blur expressions on their face is like this is a movie I saw on the DVD in the in the video shop when I was ten and was like, and said, "Mom, can I get that movie. one?" And she said, "No." <laughs> uh yeah they all they all kind of represent this kind of film in a very pure way i think um and in a in one of the weirdest examples of like personal relationships to franchises i think that that have been uh talked about on this podcast i feel like white castle was a massive influence on my creative writing <laughs> i don't i really? don't like i don't <laughs> even think i liked it that much i don't remember especially liking it but i wrote a screenplay when i was like 
15 which followed the same like basic beats of white castle like it was it was it was called sons of adam and it was a comedy about two friends who were like one is sensible and one is wacky and they're desperately trying to make their way across town in the middle of night of the night while encountering like larger than life characters and zany irrelevant interchangeable obstacles um and i don't i don't remember liking white castle that much and i don't remember consciously basing the screenplay off it but i think at some point i just saw white castle at like a very influential time in my life and assumed that's how you write a movie you know because mm. you can you can move around the different encounters they have in white castle they, they might they might like be tied together more specifically in the script that this has to happen after this but if you were just like these are the beats of the film you could move you can uh, you could put the the cheetah moment at the front yeah i like the idea that you uh, out of all films you saw howard and kumar go to white cast and you were like oh this is cinema this is cinema yeah move over martin scorsese <laughs> T- maybe you should take a leaf out of danny L- liner's book dude where's my car and harold and kumar go to white castle two great films what do you think <laughs> what like do you think white castle the the fast food chain which we don't have in new zealand mm. uh do you think it looks good in this film yeah I don't know. I I watched. I first time thinking it looked good, but this time I was like, eh, it just kind of looks like the like the disappointing version of what they advertise on the poster when they start eating it. Uh, I don't know. I think it's like again, it's one of those things that if you were high watching it and being like, holy mm. fuck, I could smash that feed. That's so true, man. That's what I needed to do. Um, <laughs> White Castle, I think, also has the is the only um fast food franchise to ever uh advertise a r-rated film because Mm. they they like had brand deals with harold and kuma um yeah so i was as i said i think the second film guantanamo bay is the weakest it is probably the most blatant in its conversation about race and stereotypes like it's the whole thing is predicated off kumar being mistaken for a terrorist and stuff like that Mm. um but it also doesn't seem to live up to its own rules like there's like enlightened rednecks and middle eastern terrorists and like a frat boy fiance and they're all they all turn out to just be their stereotypes you know and in a movie that's so putting so much work in other areas to say these stereotypes aren't true it's like but these ones are um (laughs) and it feels less likely that it means there is nuance to the film's message and more like the the two directors don't really know what they're trying to say <laughs> mm. like they're not putting thought into their their bit characters because it's like yeah they can be stereotypes they don't matter <laughs> every terrorist is middle east and it's fine um i think the weakest aspects of the film is that the mission harold of harold trying to reunite with maria in amsterdam mere moments after talking to her in the first film it's i think it's, it's weird <laughs> Yeah, it's so weird. And this is brought up in the film. Like, he's like, oh, she's going to think I'm a stalker. But then it's like, it's yeah, she fucking over. is. Yeah, You're yeah, following exactly. her to Amsterdam. Insane. And But then when he finally meets Maria in Amsterdam, she's stoked to see him. And they're like, let's go smoke weed together. And she's like, sounds like a good time. And it's like, this is such a fantasy. This is such a yeah. stoner bro fantasy. I th- And I think overall, she's Stow a pretty bro. flimsy yeah <laughs> she's a pretty flimsy male fantasy character across all three films i think if you look at like she, the purpose she serves even in the third one mm, which is like just fuck like, a baby into me yeah fuck a baby into me what a great line <laughs> a different time uh, and this brings me richard to a conversation we have to have on the harold and kumar episode a, a a staple and what has become one of my favorite recurring themes of this podcast which scene depiction or idea perpetrated by the films do you think is the most problematic and why and as usual just a quick note of sensitivity um richard and i we try to talk the, the best way we can about this stuff uh, um but we are too straight white dudes so we may say something wrong and if we do please let us know because we want to understand and and be better you know we're not we're not being like people are too sensitive just let me say my problematic slurs if we say something wrong please let us know so what that being said richard what do you think is the most Um, dated shit in this trilogy i don't think any of it is 
very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> it's all fine and you're all weak and, <laughs> and need to get you over it. snowflakes, listen here. <laughs> it's PC gone mad. It's PC gone mad. Um, I don't know. I, 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 I don't have one uh, moment springing to mind. I'd say Guantanamo Bay is definitely the most dated. Um, mm. But... Yeah, I don't know. There's just like lines here and there that you're like probably wouldn't say that these days. Yeah, it's very male gazy, and it feels like such a time capsule, especially in the time we're living in now. Like yeah, it, it is, is insane like the, the, to think that a movie like this would would be a mainstream release. And yeah, which and, is and why like, again, like we've brought it up a lot, but I'm really curious to see the new American Pie straight to DVD film because yeah. essentially the. The American Pie straight to DVD, the American Pie Presents series, uh, got, you know, made any money on the promise that you'd probably see boobs in them. Mm. Like, that's the only did. reason anyone watched those. Um, yeah. And I mean, the Book of Love I has very brief nudity. Um, mm. Whereas something like, you know, The Naked Mile is wall to wall nudity. And um, yeah, so I, I'm. But you don't get those kind of movies anymore, like as much anymore. No. I mean, they they probably are still making them, and we just don't see them. But the kind of ones that you you would just see under new release, you'd never heard of, but it looked like it might have female nudity in it. So you you mm. get your sleepover of la- of the lads, and you're staying yeah. at the one with the cool mum's house. He'll let you get out this R rated movie, and yeah. um. Yeah, it, it is very interesting because you just just because you're talking about the male gaze, um, and I mean I'm not saying I'm not saying it's a bad thing that they don't make these films anymore. It's just an interesting thing that seems to have disappeared. Yeah, and I, I think it's a good thing. I think people are making a conscious effort to not. I mean, you, there's there's the hmm. double edged sort of it. It's like one of it is like people are being better people, but it's also like people are wanting to make money and people aren't aren't wanting to support. Yeah, well, yeah, well, so you look at something like, um, I'd say the most, uh, well, an example at least of a recent teen sex comedy we've had would be Booksmart. Um, right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, which is, you know, it's about, you, you know, one, one of the main characters specifically is trying to get laid. She's a lesbian. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, there's no, it, it's it's not a particular, it, it's it's not not a raunchy film, but it's not what I would sort of classify as like, you know, you're, you're your hmm. teen sex romp and the, and yeah. it didn't do very well and i think that it kind of is i think that is part of it that it's not drawing in that um leery kind of crowd yeah and uh, i mean we're, like which again is a good thing but it is just like it's it's a weird thing to say five ten years down the road as we get to the end of the next decade i wonder if if we're gonna ever see like a rebound of like fuck this is why these films are losing money let's mm. you know because that because mm, yeah, and, yeah. and like you look at um like horror movies of the 80s and things like that there would always just be like a gratuitous topless shot because it put mm. butts in the seats and um yeah i do wonder if hollywood is ever going to try that again yeah no, definitely. Um, and it, like it is worth noting if you if you haven't been paying attention as well that the new American Pie presents straight to DVD film will be called uh, Girls Rules, so it's it's female centric. So maybe it will be something more akin to um, Booksmart. And I've said it before, I think, and I'll say it again: we better see some fucking dick in that movie. <laughs> we better see some sick swaying dong, dude, mm. for the ladies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So two scenes in um in the series stand out to me as being laden with some pretty toxic ideas. Um, the first of which would be the bottomless party from Guantanamo Bay, which I'm pretty sure is the first time I saw a vagina in a movie. <laughs> I don't remember ever seeing vaginas in film until Guantanamo Bay. Um, so yeah, they go to this party, and the rule of the party is you have to wear a shirt, but you, but you can't wear pants you know you have to be naked from the waist out and it's so bad like i think it's really gross to watch now and i may have only noticed this because i'm an editor but there's a part where they're talking to the guy at the party and the film is edited so that we just get b-roll shot after b-roll shot of half naked woman at the party and the sequence goes for so long and like i, if I it will were a say different though scene, in, in that scene's defense um it is 
we it's cutting from he's talking and Harold and Kuma are incredibly distracted by what's going on. So it's it's not a random piece of editing. <sighs> it's so it it's like, so it, it's supposed to be like a point indulgent of view kind of though. Thing. I don't know. I feel like if it was a different scene that wasn't about naked ladies, it would have just cut back to the characters. Yeah, talking. well, it, it like, feels gratuitous, but it's not without motivation from an editing yeah, standpoint. P- perhaps, but I I think I think it's. It's it is the editor's motivated by something. I think yeah, is yeah, what yeah. I'm saying. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, but it is like it, it is storytelling. Sure, I don't know. I felt like it went for too long, even with that um, consideration. Uh, but and I'm I'm conscious of coming across as sex negative here, and I don't I don't want to be that because I think I'm a pretty sex positive person. But I'm so weirded out by the 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 idea of a bottomless party like male or female and it triggers some kind of repressed germaphobe in me where i see all these people sitting bare butt on like leather couches or just generally moving around with their genitals making direct contact with things but that's the joke of the scene but i, mm. I was like oh i like it i've as like even as a teenager i didn't i wasn't like this is one of the sexy parts of the movie i always just felt kind of weird that people were just hanging around with their 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 jennies out <laughs> is there a female version of hang and dong D- displaying <laughs> uh the worst scene in the whole trilogy though i think is also from guantanamo bay surprise surprise uh, and it's the mere five minutes and 33 seconds of the film which actually take place in the titular location richard <laughs> the guantanamo bay scene itself um harold and kumar are faced with the hilariously comical idea of prison rape and because it's sexual assault on men we're allowed to joke about it <laughs> um and in amongst these rape jokes, because the the guards at Guantanamo Bay I want them to 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 suck their dicks, uh, and in amongst these rape jokes in this scene, we also get a nice helping of homophobia, where he's like, "It's nothing gay about getting your dick sucked. I'm not gay." Uh, and why not throw in one of the trilogy's rare cases of actual racism here with the terrorist stereotypes in the neighboring cell? Um, it's weird. It's 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 very it's very it's a very sad scene. I think in 2019 mm. to to watch. Um, and it's also kind of like alarmingly patriotic. And it's creepy to see a film in the like America fuck year stage of post 9 11. We haven't bought mm. 9 11 in a while. Um, <laughs> where where they're like America. They're essentially telling these terrorists that America is better, and any rebuttal the the terrorists have about like like they're like you blow up buildings and kill innocent people, and the terrorists are like, well, you eat heaps of donuts, and it's like, well, America also blows up buildings and kills innocent people. Like it's not, you know what I mean. Mm. Um, this scene is the ultimate visual representation of it was a different time. I think like mm. this is a a fossil of a scene. <laughs> Uh, there's another scene in Guantanamo Bay where Kumar orchestrates a threesome at a brothel, and I find Cal Penn's performance so creepily realistic here. And it was like he's like gruff, whispering. He's like, "Oh, maybe you should kiss her." And like, "Oh, boner achieved." He's got like this giddy confidence, which, which is how I probably would be if I was orchestrating that. Um, and it reminds me of that one friend everyone has who you hate to be around when they're clearly clearly flirting with someone, oh, and it's. My- painfully God. obvious and cringy and scenes like this make it hard to imagine it was a particularly safe and professional set for the woman in the scene though you know that's me reading too much into it but i wouldn't be surprised if people were like yeah it wasn't a good time being on set of um harold and kumar escape from guantanamo bay i remember reading have you ever seen good luck chuck oh yeah fuck you man that, that was actually i had that on my Apple classic yeah that's my I've seen it like 20 times <laughs> and i remember hearing people t- i remember reading that like the woman because there's heaps of sex scenes in that movie and hearing people would uh, it apparently was a pretty bro set and people would be like oh let's just film another sex scene with dane cook and this hot naked chick and it, it apparently wasn't very above board um mm. it's one thing i know about dane cook he loves to fuck <laughs> That's true. That is true. One of the only people in the world who <laughs> loves to fuck. 
Uh, and one of the most problematic moments of the film, though, Richard, it's probably worth mentioning that Amnesty International USA was highly critical of the film's satirical depiction of Guantanamo Bay detention camp, commenting on their website that Guantanamo is no joke. The organization's membership was encouraged to hand out flyers and fact sheets at theatrical screenings to bring attention to the alleged human rights abuses that have occurred at the camp. Yeah. <laughs> That's, you know, mm. it's such a weirdly pro-American movie, like at a time when when America was, well, I was going to say at its worst, but it's probably worse now. Yeah, well, yeah, um, it's funny how <laughs> it kind of, it takes um, end of, like, how it depicts George Bush. Yeah, it, even, it makes George Bush, like, the, the who we hope he is, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and so it's still kind of pro-George Bush in a weird way. Yeah, the, the lovable idiot. Yeah. One thing I do like about Guantanamo Bay, the film, not the not the camp, not the um, concentration not camp, the, not the detention center, yeah, uh, is the poem that Kumar recites to win Vanessa square back. Square root of three. The square root of three. I've always really liked that poem. I think it's really sweet. Um, and it was written by someone named David Feinberg, who is a classmate of John Hurwitz and Hayden Schlossberg. Oh, more like David Fine poet. Oh, yeah. Um, they were happy they could include the film the, in the film a poem that they had loved growing up, and Feinberg was thrilled to make a contribution to the film. So that's pretty sweet. Do you remember any other poem? Do you want to give us a little bit of it? Uh, something is like Route 3, um, yeah. and then you, you fucking, um, I'm it's lonely. It's about, because I think r- the square root of three is an impossible number or something. So it's like about two impossible numbers meeting and becoming an integer. Or something like that. I don't know. It's very sweet. Look it up. Yeah, it's... um. um no, the square root of three is like... Uh, it's an irrational number. Uh, where it, um, that's what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, repeats. Yeah. There you go. So, Richard, Harold and Kumar's 3D Christmas... Or no, a very Harold and Kumar 3D Christmas. As I said, I thought it was better than I was expecting. Um, And I think it's a real fascinating movie. It has such uh, like distant sequel energy, despite coming out less than the time between Guantanamo Bay mm. and White Castle. Although, you know, like, yeah, yeah, I guess I, I didn't mention it at the start, but because um, Guantanamo Bay and White Castle are set, you know, over a couple of days, um, the uh, Christmas is set. Uh, seven years, like it's yeah, yeah. in real time from White Castle, even though it's close to when Guantanamo Bay came out. So it's yeah. seven years after Guantanamo Bay. Yeah, and because of this, the third film starts, I think, in a really interesting place of seeing the characters having moved on with their lives and falling out with each other. And it was a really fun place to put the characters, I thought, and watching them reconnect and go on their first wild odyssey and years it's like there's like even a part where they go to white castle again and it's like remember this movie that came out 20 years ago but it's like it came out less than 10 years ago (laughs) and it hasn't been that long since the the second film um and it's just interesting to see a film have such yeah as i say distant sequel energy the likes of american reunion or whatever but not actually technically be be one in terms of when we got it um i think that the 3d element in the film is really unnecessary but hey yeah. 2011 was a different exactly. time <laughs> well, it, uh, i don't know if- i don't know it's one of the best movies to use the 3d presume i've seen it in 3d but like that res- that like small resurgence of 3d we had after yeah, Avatar. yeah it's one of the like only real like whoa kind of yeah films. so things there are there are a few moments like flashy moments where 3d objects fly towards the screen uh, but I don't know if you noticed, 90% of these objects are like white, featureless, geometric shapes. <laughs> like <laughs> eggs and a ping pong ball. There's a tooth. There's a rolled up joint. Um, Danny Trejo's jizz. And it's like, these aren't, this is very lazy. This is very easily modeled. <laughs> like, and it, 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 it felt, that's, I think that helped toward making it feel like kind when of is, um, unnecessary and cheap. Danny Trejo's jizz. Uh, it's when these like he's like we're gonna he's like out, outlining the plan to get the tree back and like we're gonna get the tree back and your father in law is gonna jizz all over That's it and it's right. like a freeze frame of him and you see like jizz it's like a freeze like a three D move like dynamic freeze frame like uh, the jizz. matrix yeah that kind of movie, yeah, yeah 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 um there are a couple of fun connections 
Richard in this franchise in this movie that that has other franchises we've covered uh at one point we see the mob boss character watching a Medea film mm. you remember Medea mm. yeah uh but by far the most exciting instance is we see Santa Claus in the film and he's played by film franchise Fortnite's MVP and member of what I refer to on our Discord server as the Mount Rushmore of straight to DVD sequels Richard Real. Richard Real is plays Santa in this which would be funny enough if he just showed up in another film franchise Fortnite's movie but we've already seen him play Santa Claus before in uh The Search for Santa Paws and Puppy Star Christmas which are two of the many air Bud films we painstakingly watched last year um and you know while it's tempting for me to be like does this mean harold and kumar and Earbud take place in the same universe that classic gag of mine i looked it up uh and richard real has actually played santa in seven films and tv shows and, and so the other five include uh the hebrew hammer which is like a Jewish black exploitation film. Uh, the Three Dogateers, a presumably another dog film. <laughs> um, Our First Christmas, which is a a, a TV movie, uh, and he also played Santa in episodes of The League and Two and a Half Men. So, Richard, does this mean that Howard and Kumar, Earbud, The Hebrew Hammer, The Three Dogateers, Our First Christmas, The League, and Two and a Half Men all take place in the same non-Santatheistic universe? No. Wow, you heard it here first, folks. <laughs> what do you think about this film not being Santa atheist? Which, for those who didn't listen to our episode last week, means Santa is real in the universe of Harold and Kumar. I don't know. I kind of like it. I, I I like the absurdity. Like, there's something very specific to this genre. It feels like taking that the first one's a very simple idea but gone crazy and then the second one is just the fucking most insane idea and like series of events um and then the third one it's like santa's real (laughs) yeah right yeah you know i like uh, yeah i I, I love that Mm -hmm. and also one of my favorite parts of the whole trilogy is when harold um harold tells danny trejo that he shot santa (laughs) Because he's like, because when Daddy Trey is giving him shit and he's like, and the bit where he goes, he shows that he has cojones. He's, mm. um, <laughs> yeah, he's like telling him about his day and he's like, no, f- shut the fuck up. I've been through so much. He's like, I shot Santa in the face. He's real. And I shot him in the <laughs> face. <laughs> and his, his delivery is so good. Yeah. Um. All right. That, fair enough. I was, I was a little i was like mm, i don't know if this fits but you've convinced me i think the other way <laughs> so congratulations what did you think of this film trying to make college humors amir blumenfeld the next big thing? oh my god he's <laughs> awful he's so annoying in this film so the the director or directors of this film there's just one for this one just one uh he he's a college humor director um uh. he, and so it was kind of like because amir from Jake and Amir. I don't know if you guys have seen College Humor. I've actually never watched Jake and Amir. I just recognize his face from. Oh, really? Funny. Yeah. Yeah, he plays. Like, like Harold and Kumar both get like annoying sidekicks who are then put together <laughs> for some reason. I liked Harold's sidekick. Oh, though. Thomas Lennon's fantastic. He um, yeah, he thought he was hilarious. And, and it, it's one of those things where you watch Amir in these. Um, like Jake and Amir sketches or like any other sketches on college humor from around that time. And you're like, Oh, this guy's like pretty talented. He's pretty funny. He's a pretty decent actor. But then you put him with someone like Thomas Lennon, who's playing like a silly character. And he's not even, you know, one of the great actors or someone like (laughs) Cal Penn or John Cho. Um, And you're like, Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. No, (laughs) this is what it looks like. Yeah. No, I get that. Um, and his character's just so annoying. He's the reason for everything that goes wrong with this film. Mm. And then, but then they don't even really do anything with the character. Yeah, you know, that's well. the thing. Like, it feels like yeah, this kind of lazy um, thing. Yeah. Although I, I do find it really funny when he's like, so this party, the the mob boss, the the, the mob boss's kids party. Um, he shows up, and then Amir grabs Thomas Lennon and is like. Come with me if you want to like, like you know, 
I, I know how to get us out of here. And they just hide mm-hmm. in the closet. And every single other person from the party manages to escape, escape except for those two. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's it's, it's kind of stuff. a funny, like, setup. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, man. And there's also a fun um, stop motion animated, like, Christmassy mm. section in this film where they get high on um, drugged eggnog while trying to escape. So that's worth mentioning. Drug nog. Drug nog. So, Richard, having uh, grown up, you know, somewhat attached to the series, do you have any favorite jokes or favorite moments or anything you really liked that you want to just throw out there into the ether so people can know what your favorite parts of Harold and Kumar are? Um, well, uh, like I mentioned before, I love the um, the Neil Patrick Harris scene in um, the third one. Yeah. Just the absurdity of it. And it's it's one of those things like he, he is using like you know some problematic language, but it's because it, it, he's playing a parody of his, of himself that it's mm. you know that it, that it's funny. Like um, one of my favorite lines is when he's like um, <laughs> he's he's about to um, ejaculate on a girl's back, and she's like, <laughs> "What? I thought you were gay." And he goes, "I am gay. Gay for that pussy." <laughs> It's, it's such an absurd line. I love how his actual husband is in the scene. Yeah, yeah, David Burke, that, yeah. Where, And they, they, as soon as they get into their, their dressing room, he's like, I told you not to kiss me with tongue. And he's like, oh, whatever. I've got a wife and kids at home. I don't need this. Yeah. I and it, yeah, he goes, um, he's like, I said, make it realistic, not gay as shit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, jeez. Ah, <laughs> uh, Neil. Uh. But it is like, um, and also it's funny because Neil Patrick Harris is um, credited in these films as Neil Patrick Harris, not as himself. And that's a deliberate um, thing to make people not think that he's, you know, playing himself. Actually like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, One of my favorite jokes in the trilogy is in Harold and Kumar Escape from Guantanamo Bay. They're like hiding from two KKK members and one of them starts peeing in a bush and he goes, ah. You know, when it comes to feeling good, I put pissing right up there with shitting and coming. (laughs) Such a stupid line. I think it's so funny. And I also read these two instances in Guantanamo Bay where a character um, kicks another character in the in the nuts and they fart out of the (laughs) immediate reaction. And I just think that's a great little. It might be my favorite fart joke in cinema. It's it's just so silly. Yeah, it's like it's it's purely post production as well. It's just you put the sound effect in because no one reacts to it or anything. It's just yeah. yeah. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's very very clever yeah nice well richard it is time for us to move on to a little segment we call dumb imdb trivia now as we usually explain before dumb imdb trivia imdb trivia is user submitted so a lot of it can feel not really like trivia and more like um just things people noticed however i have noticed and have just leaned into the fact that in more recent episodes we basically use dumb imdb trivia to talk about any trivia on imdb uh with the proviso that it might not be true right <laughs> that's that's more what dumb imdb trivia has become than than actual stupid pieces of trivia there is that but there are, it's also just stuff that we can't verify and aren't going to bother to verify so I've got one for each each movie. Here. Hell yeah! In White Castle, the def this is on the the IMDb trivia section for Harold and Kumar go to White Castle. The defecation sounds from the woman's washroom scene. So there's a scene where these women are playing these women's these women are playing battle shits where they do big shits in a. Yeah, a, and there doesn't a, appear to be any rules. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, what are the rules to battle shits? Uh, so the defecation sounds from the woman's washroom scene were real defecation sounds recorded at a truck stop by one of the film's ta- sound technicians. Ew. I, they don't sound <laughs> real. No, they don't sound real. That's fucking illegal, surely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I thought that was gross. Um, and Harold and Kumar go to, go to Guantanamo Bay. This is in the... Go to Guantanamo Bay. Escape from Guantanamo Bay. This is in the trivia section for that film. Body count, three, including one deer. Uh, this is in the spoilers section. Of the <laughs> <trivia>. <laughs> uh, and in Harold and Kumar, a very Harold and Kumar 3D Christmas in the trivia section. 
of course, is written. One of the lies that Adrian tells Mary is that Kumar works at the White House. Cal Penn, who plays Kumar, had actually been working at the White House and took time off for that job to make this movie. This is the dumbest thing ever. What? So in April 2009, Cal Penn accepted the position of Associate Director of the White House Office of Public Liaison in the Obama administration. Uh, Penn briefly left his job at the White House on June 1st, 2010 to reprise his role as Kumar in the third film. That's so crazy that out of all the actors who would mm. go into politics, Cal Penn is Yeah, is well, because he was on um, House at the time as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that, because like how this set, then that season House had a bunch of interns or something. And um, yeah. then they, he just doesn't show up to work one day. So they go to his apartment and he's killed himself because they had, they, they, they had to write him out of the series, but they couldn't, um, uh, I, I don't think they even had like an episode for him. Like they didn't even have the chance to film a leaving right. episode. So they just cut to like, right. you know, you see his feet, um, in a pool of blood at his apartment. And, um, it's, it's actually like a lot of people, um, didn't really like it because it was so out of the blue, but that's kind of the whole point of the, the episode's called no reason. I'm pretty sure and it's about right. how like, sometimes you can't you can't um diagnose these things they just happen wow that's pretty full on um mm. and so it's, so, a, it's yeah. a big thing for house um to to deal with because he you know he's he's the genius who should have been mm. able to see it coming and he didn't mm. wow and from house to the white house cal Penn flew very nice uh yeah um and i yeah i just think it's strange like especially with someone like you often hear politicians talk about how like oh i hope this never comes back to to or not even politicians people who joke about getting into politics sometimes will be like oh i hope this doesn't come back to bite me when i start my political career and it's like this guy's been in these problematic stoner films and it's like surely that although i guess he's not an elected official he's a mm. he's an employee um also sorry the episode is actually called simple explanation it's about how there's no simple explanation and also the meat, opposite of no meatloaf reason. isn't it oh yeah. good i'm glad um yeah it, it is funny that it's like uh, obama has to be aware of the existence of a uh, very harold and kumar christmas i uh, loved you in uh harold and kumar go to white castle um, oh, that, that's great that you mentioned that because I actually need to to leave to go be in the third film. Ah, oh, what's it called? I love it. <laughs> I will be there opening night. Let me be clear. Cool. Well, you know, moving on again, Richard, in the seamless segue where I just say moving on again. Um, one of the things that that historically we've always talked about on this podcast, Richard, are uh, the titles of the film. I feel like we haven't had a good title discussion in a long time. Yeah feel like it's been a while. So we talk about titles a lot on this podcast because I'm obsessed with titles and titles are usually real bad in franchises and I wish they weren't. And I don't know, I don't know why I'm the only one who cares about this. <laughs> uh, so there are a few talking points to do with titles. The first film was retitled in the UK to Harold and Kumar Get the Munchies because White Castle wasn't a thing and isn't a thing over there and it's not a thing over here either but we still got white castle which title do you prefer uh i don't know i kind of like white castle i do too even though get the munchies feels like i always feel like it, it's, it's telling you a bit more title. what you're in for yeah 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 maybe it's the the myst mystery of white castle that if having not known what it was that um mm. that makes it more yeah because because I, I guess like getting the munchies is like again it already sets up like the weed and and stuff like that where it's just the idea of harold and kumar go to white castle was like well then why how is this a movie <laughs> yeah 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 i'm really grumpy that the third film bucks the trend of such an easy to adapt titling scheme it's it's like what it's also one of those rare films where 3d is officially part of the title mm. you know it's not like other ones where it's like in 3d or whatever this is called harold and kumar a very harold and kumar 3d christmas and it, it annoys me because not not just because it bucks the trend but harold and kumar isn't an adjective and i think a very blank christmas as a titling scheme only works when there's an adjective in your original title like right. the, the always sunny christmas special is called a very sunny christmas and there's there's a supernatural episode called a very supernatural christmas and it's like a very what is a, a Harold and Kumar Christmas? I I'd have called the film Harold and Kumar Ruin Christmas. Nice, yeah. I think that's a better title. 
Yeah. And that promises the the wacky, inane hijinks of of um Harold and Kumar as a as a pair, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Harold and Kumar escape from Christmas. Wow. <laughs> Harold and Kumar go to Christmas. Go to Christmas. Go to White Christmas. Ooh. Harold and Kumar um, shoot Santa in the face. <laughs> Harold and Kumar kill Santa Claus. That's a, yeah, that could be one. Yeah, that's good. They one. don't. People be like, even though the the title is called Harold and Kilmar kill Kilmar Kilmar <laughs> kill, <laughs> kill Santa Claus. Santa doesn't actually die in the movie, and they only spend five minutes at Guantanamo Bay. Um. Uh. Yeah. Also, um, I just remembered another one of my favorite jokes. Well, one of the ones I liked growing up. Um, it's where they run into the racist police officer in the first movie and he's like, um, and Kumar tells him his name is Kumar and it's like almost like an off mic line and he, or just like, it's real throwaway, but he's like, Kumar, what is that? Like, is that like three O's or is that like five U's? And it's like, <laughs> why would you spell a name with five U's? <laughs> Richard, are you keen to continue this franchise with me? Yes. Sick. So this is our uh, final segment of the episode. I always have to make sure that it is the final segment on certain episodes uh, where we continue the franchise. uh, But before we get to our own ideas, um, there are a few continuations and rumblings of continuations already out there in the ether. Mm -hmm. Um, The smallest of which is probably the characters of Rosenberg and Goldstein, um, who are like the, the Jewish Harold and Kumar. Um, who are, who are like their their neighbors in the first film and show up yeah, in each um, of the films? Uh, Eddie K. Thomas from um, uh, American Pie, Finch, Shipbreak, mm-hmm. and um, uh, David Crumholtz, who's in yep. another trilogy mm, coming up. Oh, he is too. Uh, yeah, so they were named after the characters Rosencrantz and Guildenstein from William Shakespeare's Hamlet. The writers of White Castle hoped to create an alternate film with these characters that takes place at the same at the same time period, um, just like Rosencrantz and Guildenstein are dead, which takes place during the same time, same time period as Hamlet. Isn't that so obvious now that, mm. <laughs> like, of course you'd, you'd name the characters. They go on a parallel adventure and Harold and Kumar go to White Castle. And it's I'd like, love to see them uh, make their when, but now they're like in their forties. Yeah. But it's like, <laughs> oh, remember this one crazy night we had? Yeah. So that's pretty interesting. Uh, on the two disc version of the Guantanamo Bay DVD, there's a special feature called "Dude Change the Movie," where that which lets uh, the viewer watch a short film called Harold and Kumar Go to Amsterdam which tells the story of what would have happened if Harold and Kumar had not been sent to Guantanamo Bay and had made it to Amsterdam. But they do make it to Amsterdam. They do. I think it's like they don't get kicked off the yeah, plane. Yeah. That's yeah. cool. I actually didn't know about that. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a, I think it's 12 minutes long, so it could be a cool thing to watch in, for a future episode of film franchise follow-ups over on patreon.com slash cult popshire. All right, but in terms of a fourth Harold and Kumar film... In July 2016, uh, John Cho, who plays Kumar, no, who plays Harold, uh, revealed that he pitched an idea for a fourth Harold and Kumar and felt there was a chance it might get made. In an interview with Den of Geek, uh, Ch- there's an exclamation mark, um, <laughs> Cho stated, I thought I had a really great idea and I pitched it out to the director when we happened to be having dinner one night and I don't know, I think we're going to get this made. Uh, and as recently of August this year, Cal Penn, who plays Kumar, confirmed that plans for a fourth film were still in development and everyone was keen to be involved despite their busy schedules, saying, I would consider myself lucky if I had a chance to make Harold and Kumar 15 when I'm 70 years old. Hell yeah. I, lo- I love that these guys love these movies. Mm, um, yeah. And like that Cal Penn left the White House to do it. Um, yeah. I believe there was also uh, Neil Patrick Harris mentioned that apparently a spinoff about his character was talked about. Mm. But yeah, that's another great running gag in the series is that it's a very subtle one, but that um, everyone calls NPH Mr. Patrick Harris. <laughs> where like his, his like his last name is just Harris. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's it's just a like it's yeah, it's a reoccurring thing. It's it's almost to the point where. I don't know if it's supposed to be funny, like, but just because right. he's like, I love you. And he's like, I love you, Mr. Patrick Harris. <laughs> but then they did start a couple more times. So Richard, what are you pitching me today? All right. To continue the franchise. I'm going to pitch you 
Harold and Kumar die. Oh, my God. It would involve some wacky adventure that brings them back together. Um, and they die. And oh, then no. it's about having to uh, leave the, like, uh, well, they'd go to hell. It could be called Harold and Kumar go to hell. I love it. And it's about, like, essentially escaping literal hell to make it back to their mm. bodies. Mm. Imagine if it was just about the family dealing with the death of their friends. Yeah. It's called Harold and Kumar No Reason. <laughs> Simple explanation. Yeah. <laughs> no, I like that. That that genuinely feels like a place the series would go yeah. after 3D Christmas. Nice. That's better than my idea, which is Harold and Kumar go to White House. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, they both get jobs working under President Trump, but use it as an opportunity to take down the government from the inside, impeach the president, and legalize marijuana across the nation. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah. Hell. Well, <laughs> what's up? <laughs> what's up? Well, 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 that brings us to the end of the episode. Richard, thank you for joining me in this exploration of Harold and Kumar. Sick. It was very kind of you to do that for me. Hey, you know what? Um I love you. Oh wow, that's so emotional. <laughs> Um, what are we doing I'm next week? I do know what how many ums I cut out in the edit, and whenever I do one, I'm like, "Stop fucking saying um." Um, the <laughs> <laughs> our next franchise we're doing is, of course, the Santa Claus trilogy, which you can come watch us do live if you want over um, at a Little Andromeda in Christchurch on December 16th. So come along to that. You can watch the films, or you can not watch the films. It doesn't matter. There's three of them. They star Tim Allen. One of them is Martin Short, and the guy who plays what's his name, David Crum. Crum David Crum- Crumholtz. Crumholtz. Yeah. So uh, that'll be our next franchise. Next week we're going to be doing the the much teased episode of Netflixmas 2019, which I feel like we've been talking about, or maybe we've just been doing for a long time. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I watched the first movie like <laughs> over a month ago yeah yeah <laughs> so that's happening next week uh so join us for that and uh if you liked this this podcast then please consider supporting us on patreon um there'll be links to that as well as the live show in the description and there will also be links to our discord where you can go and chat with us and other cop mm, fans you can go on discord um, or Deckcord. very good did you do that last time as well i think i did yeah fuck i'm uh, such a hack we're, we're also, of course, on Facebook and YouTube and Instagram and Twitter, Cult Pop Show, all those places. Or you can email us at coldpopshowmedia at gmail.com. Let us know what you thought of the Harold and Kumar franchise. Um, but beyond that, Richard, it's time to go and get some get some White Castle. Get Castles. some weed. Get some weed. Get, get some, some weed. weed. This episode gets... <laughs> Um, a million hits I will smoke weed on the podcast <laughs> goodbye everybody I'll smoke one weed is that a weed? <laughs>